Can healing be an act of justice? This week on the show, Adaku Yuta of Harriet's Apothecary and J. Babalata of the Astrea Foundation on healing, collective and individual. It's all coming up here on The Laura Flanders Show, where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the ones who are doing it. Welcome. Caught at the intersections of racism, sexism, class, and transphobia, violence against trans women of color has broken out of invisibility. 2016 was the deadliest year on record for transgender people, with 27 reported deaths, 23 of those transgender women of color. It is clear that the safety of this community will not be a priority for the White House or even a federally recognized problem, even given the rise in hate crimes. Only a month after taking office, the administration revoked federal guidelines protecting transgender students in public schools. That's just a start. So what to do and what's at stake for non-trans people? Author, poet, and activist Audre Lorde once said, if I cannot air this pain and alter it, I will surely die from it. That is the beginning of social protest. Our conversation today is about healing, the need for it, the possibility of it, and what sorts of spaces enable it. I'm joined by two guests who are at the forefront of a movement for healing justice. Adaku Uta is a healer, educator, and the founder of Harriet's Apothecary, an intergenerational healing collective led by black, cis women, queer, and trans healers. Also with us, J. Bob Alotta. She is the executive director of the Australia Lesbian Foundation for Justice, a global foundation based in New York City that provides critical resources to LGBTQI organizations and individuals around the world. Welcome both. I'm so glad to have you. Thank you. Let's just start with what we're up against. Um, I, don't wanna, I don't know who wants to take it this first, but it was pretty stark that within the first hour of the current administration taking office, the LGBTQ government page that had been an innovation of the Obama administration was gone from the .gov website. And that was just a start. How do you see what we're up against? So before I answer this question, I just wanna um, take a breath to honor the trans women of color whose lives we've lost since the beginning of 2017 and since the beginning of our lifetime. So if we can just take a breath. So it's important that our, our movements are reflective of the kind of world that we want to create. And um, our movements can't win if we leave certain bodies behind or if certain bodies, whether individual or collective bodies, are trying to catch up. And unfortunately, we live in a world where um, our system, our society thrives off of and lives off of the dehumanization and the violence of um, our most marginalized folks, so our queer and trans folks, our immigrants, um, folks who are incarcerated, people who are poor. And um, for us to stand up and say, actually, our lives are filled with dignity and humanity, we are combating what the system um, has taught us from, from when we're in the womb, um, that our bodies um, don't matter, that our bodies are not valuable and don't have humanity and dignity. And so for us, centering healing is such a necessary strategy in moving towards the kind of world that we want to live in and who we want to embody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and how would you answer that question, mm -hmm. Bob, with respect to what we're up against, and as that doc was saying, what then it says about our priorities? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that when we look at whether it's um, specific policies that are being made against us mm -hmm. or those that are getting taken away um, to protect from protecting us mm -hmm. um, or even just invisibilizing us, as you were talking about with the web page, um, is that actually violence against us is a requirement mm -hmm. for the, the systems in place to thrive. And I think actually understanding that it isn't a byproduct, the fact that seven um, trans women of color have been killed this year to date on record, and surely, surely mm -hmm. that's just what's on record, is not, um, it, it's not a coincidence, um, it's actually a requirement to ensure that power lies uh, where they intend for it to lie. Mm -hmm. Now we're taught many things in our society and we'll, we'll talk about more of them in this conversation, but one of the things we're taught is to often separate ourselves from the people who are most at risk with the hope that if they take the heat, we won't have to. Mm -hmm. Talk to people who have yet to grasp why what happens to trans people, especially trans people of color, women and men, is important. 
to them? Mm -hmm. Bob? Mm -hmm. That's a great question, and I really appreciate that. There's always a chain mm -hmm. um, until the chain doesn't exist, right? Mm -hmm. There's always a distance until there isn't any distance, mm -hmm. and, and I don't, I'm not saying that to suggest, well, they're going to come for you eventually, so you might as well show up for us now. That's not what I'm saying, but that, that, that safety is false. Um, at all times, and, and that's what I mean. What is deviant? What deviates from a norm? What does that require from um, even the person who would seem to embody that norm? Mm -hmm. It's dissociative. It isn't actually true. We know that it isn't true. So even if um, you identify um, with a womanhood that doesn't seem under attack, although I can't imagine what womanhood at this juncture doesn't seem under attack in this mm -hmm. country, um, or a malehood or any kind of personhood mm -hmm. that doesn't seem under attack, it actually is. There's a requirement if, if, um, if the norm is going to exist outside of you, you have to then embody um, a, a restrictive um, identity that isn't based on your reality. It's actually based on um, structures of power that, uh, that doesn't honor the humanness in us. It limits all of us in terms of the total self that we're allowed to embody. I have to say, when it was proposed to me that we do a panel on healing, me, in my white leftist <laughs> way, even queer way, was like, healing. That's an individual solution. It's woo-woo. It's what happened to the state. So, so talk about healing. Is healing collective work or individual work? Healing is encompassing of both an individual and collective. We know that our movements moving towards justice does not only rely on one person um, or a couple of people, that it actually requires all of us. And our, our systems um, come from a long legacy of violence that has impacts on our physical, emotional, and spiritual selves. And we can't intellectualize change. Who we are is what we've been practiced and what we have learned to do. Um, and so healing really facilitates a strategy for us to be embodied practitioners of justice and liberation. Um, and it also acknowledges that harm has been done. Yeah. What do you do at Harriet's Apothecary? Harriet's Apothecary is a, a love ode to black, indigenous, and people of color. We are following the legacy of um, Harriet Tubman. Um, she is an abolitionist and healing justice warrior. And she was someone who intentionally dreamt us into the future. Um, and collectively built something that had not existed before. Systems of care that centered the lives and bodies of our people. We live in a world where the mainstream health industry defined healing as a very, very static and one-size-fits-all thing. That in order to be healed, you have to say that something's wrong with you and that to be healed is inside of a rich body, a body that's thin, a body that's able-bodied, a body that's also white. And we want to say no to that, we want to resist that. We want to expand what healing can look like and also bring back the value and self-worth and self-determination that Black, Indigenous, and people of color have to be a part of their own healing. A lot of these practices are either sourced from traditional indigenous, African, Latinx practices, or things that have been handed down to us by our teachers, or things that actually come from healers' intuition. I focus mostly on rose quartz pendulum readings because of its impact on the subtle body. It's really about self-actualization. I've been doing an astrology workshop. Wherever Libra is in your chart, there's going to be a sense of diplomacy. You know, we can be so serious about our healing. No need. Have fun and laugh at ourselves and each other. Like, I'm really learning through this workshop, like, it's good to laugh. The village is a community that practices interdependence. So it's like, if you need anything, there's just this culture of, we got you. Like, whatever you need, we can find it here, or we can create it here. It allows us a space to be vulnerable and to be able to know that we can remove our mask and be in a space that will affirm and uplift us and that sees us and, and validates us. It gives us permission to be human in a world that seeks to dehumanize us at every turn. So we host healing villages throughout um, 
Brooklyn and nationally and um, internationally. And uh, we transform spaces into healing spaces that really honor the lives of black, indigenous, and people of color. And we support movement building organizations in centering a healing justice framework so that they can match their practice with their values. And, and it means sometimes doing what you just did at the top of the show, which mm -hmm. I deeply appreciated, which was bringing a moment of healing work into a busy, busy movement and media space. Yeah, and also a moment to recognize our humanity. Yeah. We're not just products producing things, we're people. Not so easy, not so mm -hmm. easy to do this work, right Bob? But talk a little bit about A, what's happening here and why you support it, why you think it's important work to talk about. Um, something that Adaku said uh, really, well, everything that Adaku said <laughs> resonated with me, but um, one thing that I want to uplift is this idea of a practice. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, that uh, for me, um, uh, it's really important to understand healing justice as uh, a strategic engagement. Mm -hmm. um, and that it's interesting that we can be comfortable with throwing around the words of like liberation, mm -hmm. right? Or movement building. And then we say the word healing and we have this sort of intellectual divorce from that mm -hmm. concept. But in fact, um, if we want our movements to sustain over time, if we want all of the participants in that movement to thrive, if we're actually talking about liberation, we're talking about the, literally the way that we live our lives. Mm -hmm. If we're saying black lives matter or queer lives matter, right? Or, or that, that we care about um, the lived experience, experiences of any particular human who's deliberately oppressed, then we are talking about um, a lived experience and, and a desire for that lived experience to be a positive one, mm -hmm. right? We actually, together, Estrella mm -hmm. and um, uh, Adaku and a number of other folks from Harriet, brought their work, a uh, healing justice frame, into a media communications and technology initiative that we have called the Comms Labs. Mm -hmm. And um, in the ways that we um, can understand technology as tools, right? There's a way that we're able to say, oh, well, this app does this for me, or this mm -hmm. technology does that for me. Um, uh, I'm really interested in us being uh, pushing the boundaries of that a little bit, thinking about technology as a terrain, and also thinking about um, healing as a technology. And what happens when we do that? It all, to my mind, speaks to the price we pay for disassociation or in a way you're trying to get this com this whole conversation forces me and people like me who have the reaction I described earlier mm -hmm. to deal with how much denial I'm in about the actual sickness mm -hmm. that society has taught me to assimilate to Absolutely. sickness of capitalism white supremacy mm -hmm. patriarchy you name it um, how do you describe that sickness? How do you describe what society's forced assimilation to those things does to all of us differently, but to all of us? I think one of the ways that I see that showing up is in the medical industrial complex and in wellness industry, there's one static definition of what it means to be healthy. That in order to be healthy, you have to occupy a white body, a body that's able-bodied, a body that's thin and that's rich and can access resources. And that if you can't, access any of those things that your body is not healthy or you're not deserving of care. And so we're removed in so many different ways from feeling like, oh, we actually deserve care. We actually deserve to be taken care of. And that something has happened to us um, and that we need to be listened to. Mm -hmm. It also gets to, are you a productive member of society? Absolutely. Who's absolutely. defining productive? Absolutely. And then it quantifies our, our bodies to what we can produce rather than in who we are. Mm. Mm -hmm. You also talk about truth and reinvestment. I mean, there, are, there is some aspect to this justice work that requires some new stuff going to people that don't have it from people who've had too much of it, isn't there? Absolutely. So, you know, our, our wellness industry and the medical industrial complex um, stems from um, white supremacy, homophobia, and transphobia. Um, propagating narratives about black bodies and queer and trans bodies, that our bodies are subhuman or not human at all, or that our bodies are objects and don't experience any kind of pain. And one of the ways, um, well, some, of the, some of the impacts of that um, is to um, medical, the medical industrial complex has used black flesh in order to um, to advance medical technology. We've seen that with Tuskegee experiments, you know, for the last, for 40 years it lasted. 
um, that offered syphilis treatments and the, um, the sterilization of black women and femmes bodies that has made it possible for OBGYN and um, gyne gynecological advancements. And so I think for me, as someone who believes in reparations um, and believes that, you know, uh, uh, black and indigenous people of color are owed legacies that have been taken away from us, um, that it requires uh, many of us, whether or not we are situated within um, an organizing movement or we are a practitioner of care, we're a healthcare practitioner, that we um, insert an intersectional analysis of how we're doing our healing and health work. That gentrification is not, is connected to depression and that um, uh, uh, white, our the violence that we've experienced from white supremacy is, is connected to fibroids. And the conflict that's you know, ripping our movements apart um, has to do with a lot of the ways that we have been siloed from each other from being enslaved peoples. And so bringing this analysis, um, I'm inviting folks, whether you're situated within the movement or you're situated within the health industry or you're somebody who's a mother, a caretaker, um, recognizing your role in um, investing in your own care and investing in care that really centers the lives and lived experiences of folks who are most marginalized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It hasn't been great for the health of oppressors either, mm -hmm. something that people need to be talking about more mm -hmm. too. Is this, how do you get at that without shedding differences and making false equivalences? I mean, I think that, the, that at, the, at the core is understanding that it's a symbiotic relationship, mm -hmm. right? In order for somebody to be oppressed or an oppressor, they need each other, right? Mm -hmm. And so in order for power to be um, uh, uneven, it's inside of a container of, of, of uh, absolute power, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think that um, for us um, uh, at Estrella, we're a public foundation. And for me, um, it took me um, it took me a while to understand what that even <laughs> meant. What does it mean to, for me now as an activist to run a foundation? And I think um, um, to the question that you just asked, mm -hmm. I really understood that it, um, you know, we raise all of the money that we invest in the communities. But what, is, that do, what does that mean? We just fundraise? And like, no, actually, we, we move money from where it purposefully is to where it purposefully is not, mm -hmm. right? So we're redirecting disparate flows of capital, right? Mm -hmm. And that's not to say that everybody who invests in Australia and thereby investing in the different movements we support mm -hmm is of tremendous means necessarily, but it's the fact that we're all participant in, uh, in this flow of capital mm -hmm. and that we can be purposeful in terms of where we're placing it and where we want it to flow to. Mm -hmm. And that to me is, is a healing endeavor. <laughs>
who are doing the work to know how to prioritize uh, uh, their own uh, budgets um, and really working with people beyond the grant in terms of getting work done. Mm -hmm. And you've made a tremendous impact when it comes to global funding. Yeah. Because you're pretty unique. Yeah, we've actually um, funded in 96 countries, which is um, half the world. Um, and we've funded, uh, we began with $400, and we have funded $31 million. Um, and I think it's very, um, I think you hear that number and you're like, oh, y'all, you know, have it done, you know? Um, and I think, imagine $31 million came from individuals and people who believed in the work. Mm -hmm. And that's a powerful redistribution yes, of, of wealth. And, and that is a healing endeavor unto itself. Absolutely. Yeah. You mentioned Kitchen Table. You mentioned the 70s. It took me back to Kitchen Table, Women of Color Press. Mm -hmm. The Combahee River Collective mm -hmm. Statement mm -hmm. takes me back to why women of color and trans women have to be the center of this conversation. Mm -hmm. Let's end there. Why and what does that look like? If you're unclear about how to do this, how do you do this work with that center point? Mm -hmm. We have to listen. Um, so I really appreciate uh, what you offered around symbiosis. I think one of the reasons why other species besides human beings have been able to exist for a really long time is because they practice interdependence. Um, there is a, a constant flow of energy that really requires listening and also an understanding that um, our humanity, nobody's humanity gets to drop here. And so we begin, we begin first with listening. So what, um, what is your life like? What do you, um, what does care and healing and wellness mean like for you? And then how can we work together? And not just isolating that conversation within an individual perspective, but expanding that conversation to really look at how can we cultivate movements that are moving towards sustainability, that are strategic, and does right by the individuals who are a part of it, by our communities, um, and by the ecosystem. It sounds, sounds as if the healing enables us to work with more love, apart from anything Absolutely. else. Absolutely. Absolutely. God, now I'm using the word love. <laughs> look, look what happened. Hey, now. <laughs> well, we're getting you. We're recruiting you. You're getting me. <laughs> yeah. mm -hmm. Absolutely, it does. I mean, there is, um, if, if love is missing somewhere along the line, our hu my humanity gets lost, your humanity gets lost, and there's a huge cost to that that's actually lethal that's deadly. Um, we've lost lives because people aren't loving each other. And not like a frivolous kind of, of love, but an accountable one um, that is uh, very grounded in, in the real lived experiences of people and is in a commitment to people's, people's livelihoods. Um, not because I'm not gonna invest in you because I want something from you mm -hmm. or because you f I feel like I can profit off of your life, mm -hmm. but because I, I care about you. Right. Yeah, and I love you. Right. Which is, I do. Right, <laughs> actually, yes, <laughs> actually. Actually, yes. But I mean, I think it's really deep that, you know, um, we've been, uh, um, I've been using the word love very Absolutely. purposefully uh, lately and, mm -hmm. and um, uh, at the Women's March, I talked about being an uprising of love. We la launched the Uprising of Love Fund, mm -hmm. and I had got a lot of pushback. Like, love is weak. Why would you, why, and, and also love is woo, right? Like, right. why would you bring that up? And, and if we don't get up in the morning, mm -hmm. and, and, and the people who are fighting very real struggles, or even strive for any ideal, mm -hmm. whether it's, it, it's, a, it's a very localized one, like, I want, to be able to eat today, or I want to feed my kids, right? Mm -hmm. Or I want to be in a movement that is meaningful, that um, allows us all to survive. If we're not actually doing that from a very radical, fierce um, place of love, mm -hmm. what actually is compelling us to do that? Mm -hmm. And so, and so, in in my estimation, it's um, it isn't that we're suggesting. Um, to adopt some radically new idea and framework and all of those things. It's actually to acknowledge the framework and the ideas that already are. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what it's costing us mm -hmm. Absolutely. to Literally. carry all that around. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Last word? There's a level of vulnerability um, that it takes to engage in conversations like this. And um, I think it's our responsibility that if we're, we're inviting people into that conversation, that we are also keeping folks safer in a way where people feel like they can actually mm. show up with all of themselves and not having to leave some of their selves behind. And um, I also believe that you know our movements are actually wide enough to hold healing and radical organizing. Um, I'm such a deep commitment to movements that are not only strategic, 
toxic, but are nourishing and sustainable. And um, you know, the, the lie of white supremacy is that we're a lot narrower than we are, and we actually have a lot more room to take up mm -hmm. space with these conversations. Mm -hmm. And our lives and movements depend on it. That's cool. Jay Bob, thank you both so much. Come on in, people. Come on in to this movement. You'll be welcome. <laughs> Promise. Thank you both. That was great. Thank you. Thank Dr. you. Bob, great mm -hmm. to have you. Come on back. Yes. Yes, please. <laughs>